Dr. Hovhannisian is well known to most of you. He's a professor emeritus of Near Eastern and Armenian history at UCLA uh, for many years. He was associate director of the Grunemann Center for Near Eastern Studies. He's been a member of the UCLA faculty since 1962. And actually, as many of you uh, also may have heard before, he taught here at Fresno State through extension back in 1960 through 1962. He was the first person to actually teach courses in Armenian studies. He has a very long resume. I'm not going to read most of it. Uh, however, he is currently a Chancellor Fellow in the Department of History uh, and the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education at Chapman, Chapman University in Southern California. And he was the first holder of the AEF Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History at UCLA. He has a long list of publications. I've already mentioned some of them. And uh, he has been someone that has uh, visited Fresno because of family uh, over the years and also has never said no when we've invited him to come and speak. So without any further introduction, I'd like to int introduce Dr. Richard Hovhannisian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dear Magritian. And uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, it, it seems I was here a short time ago. I, I didn't expect to be back, but I am, and I'm glad that I am. Uh, yeah. Uh, tonight's, tonight's subject is a serious subject. Armenian history frequently is a, a, a serious subject, and not always very pleasant, uh, and yet we should need to remember it. Uh, those of you who are active at all within the Armenian community know that uh, 2015 marks the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the end of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, various activities are being planned around the 100th anniversary that will be coming up uh, in uh, less than three years. Uh, fewer of us probably know that the Armenian Genocide was uh, only a part of a much larger process of ethnic cleansing of historic uh, lands of Asia Minor and the Armenian Plateau, not only of the Armenians, but of all the uh, Christian elements within uh, the empire. Uh, the Armenian Genocide, we frequently say, extended from 1915 to 1922 or 23. That makes sense because uh, after World War I, thousands of Armenians returned at least to some areas, uh, such as Giligia, to Maraj, to Aintab, to uh, Adana, and a number of other places, and also cities near Constantinople, only to be driven again uh, out in 1921 and 1922, when the French, Italians, and others decided they didn't want to pursue um, their pledges during World War I to punish the perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide and instead made their peace uh, with the new leaders of Turkey. 1922, September, as we heard, was the destruction of one of the most important cities of the Ottoman Empire, overwhelmingly Greek in composition. The Greeks had dominated the city culturally, religiously, economically. And uh, 1922 marks, this is the 90th anniversary, marks their destruction and exile from not only the city of Smyrna, Izmir, which is on the Aegean Sea, but from all of Asia Minor. Uh, because in 1923, uh, 1 1.4 million Greeks in what was Turkey were forcibly uh, transferred to mainland Greece or the islands of Greece, where they were never felt very much at home and always longed for their beloved Smyrna. Uh, this was a part of the ethnic cleansing that took place in the process of making Turkey a one nation, one people, one religious, one language, one culture kind of state. The transformation from the multinational, multicultural, multi-religious Ottoman Empire to the modern Turkish state that we know today is uh, overwhelmingly Muslim, 
and if it were left up to the Turkish government, would be uh, exclusively Turkish by today. Uh, because they felt in 1915 and 1920 they didn't have to deal with the Kurds. They felt the Kurds were backward and ignorant people, and that if they worked with them and to make them Turks, or, uh, that, that would be successful since they were Muslim, since they had no schools, since they had no literature, uh, to forcibly Turkify the Kurds, but as we've seen, that has backfired. Uh, <coughs> the first one. Uh, here you see, in September uh, 9th, or se September 13th of 1922, the Great Inferno that engulfed the Armenian quarter of Smyrna, known as Hainots. If you don't know Armenian, uh, Nots means a place of, and Hai means Armenian, so the place of the Armenians, Hainots. And Hainots was a, 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 a beautiful, prosperous, progressive, advanced section of the city with red tile roofs and the great cathedral of St. Stephen, or Sub Stephanos, in its heart. Uh, lying just back from the sea, and from the Armenian quarter where this fire was intentionally set, in about ten different places at the same time, with what we call in Los Angeles, and probably you know what I'm saying when I call a Santa Ana wind, blowing from the mountains toward the sea, so that the fire spread from the Armenian quarter straight toward the sea in all the Christian quarters, the Greek quarters, most of the Greek quarters, and much of the quarters of European quarters that we call Levantine. Those are people who are sort of European background but having been born in the Middle East or mixed marriages, <coughs> so that the <coughs> most prosperous and beautiful sections of the city were destroyed. And here you see a picture of one of, taken from one of the American battleships in 1922. Next. Uh, most of you here, I'm presuming, who have an Armenian background, come from the areas farther to the east in historic Armenia. I mean, when I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley, I heard the names Vaughn, Mush, Pitlis, Sepastia, Erzurum, uh, Giligia, uh, on and on. And so most Armenians uh, lived far to the east, east of this map, starting with, you can see Caesarea, I think, or Ankara, farther to the east of that um, area. Uh, uh, here's, here are the Armenian highlands, here. Uh, and so when we come way over here, it's sort of surprising, perhaps, to see that there was a significant Armenian community here. In fact, it was never huge. It was never huge. It, the whole area of Smyrna, or Izmir as it's now known, with its surrounding areas of uh, Ephesus and uh, uh, up to Pergamon in this area, about 25,000 Armenians lived in this entire area, which makes it therefore sort of interesting that I would devote an entire volume to one city and its surrounding uh, when I have taken whole Armenian provinces such as Vaughan and put them into one volume, where in Vaughan, of course, we're talking about eight or ten times as many Armenians. And I did that because Smyrna uh, has a real particular place in Armenian history. It was uh, one of the most enlightened and prosperous communities uh, in the Ottoman Empire. It sat, as you can see, right here uh, on the Aegean Sea across from the Greek islands, and traders coming from Julfa in Iran, Armenian traders who went all the way to India and to Iran and across to Smyrna where they had their uh, uh, storage houses and warehouses, and from there over to the Italian cities, over to Manchester, to Amsterdam, and so forth. So <coughs> it became a center of major Armenian uh, trade, commerce, and also of enlightenment. Probably cities on the coast, no matter where, are more enlightened than the 
cities far away inland because of the exposure uh, to the cultures, foreign cultures. And obviously, the Armenians here were going to be exposed to European uh, ideas, to literature, and so forth. And, and look, here is Constantinople, or Istanbul, the second city. Here they are. Uh, where here we have a, a community of about 150,000 Armenians. And here, in the city itself, around 10,000, and in the district itself, around 25,000. Next. Next. Here you can see the uh, city of Smyrna, Izmir. Uh, here is the Armenian quarter, Hainots. Here are the Greek quarters in this area, and the Levantine quarters. And outside the fire line, here is the fire line, where everything was destroyed, everything. I've been back twice now in one year and can find nothing Armenian left in the area. It's been totally rebuilt. And outside the city was a Jewish quarter, or outside the fire line, was a Jewish quarter, which is here. And the Muslim quarter, which was you know, uh, very quaint because it was very oriental, very back, not backward, but uh, native. And so people love to go there and watch people s smoke the nergile and play tablu and, and things of that type uh, uh, here. Next. Here's the Agora. Uh, it goes back. It, it, uh, Smyrna is an ancient city of Romo-Greco times. Next. And here you see it, the harbor. The harbor, it's, it's a natural great inlet. And you can see the old city, 19th century city, and, and the harbor next to it. Next. 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 All right, let's stop here. <coughs> <coughs> Once again, thank you. Thanks. I have some time. Uh, here, once again, I want to show you the Armenian quarter of High Notes, the Greek quarter next door with its great cathedral of St. Fotini, the, the Levantine European quarter. All of these areas are a burden. Here we have the Jewish quarter and the Turkish quarter uh, outside uh, to uh, up on the, on the hillside. <clears throat> I have to tell you a little sto a little bit of background, probably, about the immediate causes for the destruction of Smyrna. Uh, in 1919, after World War I, when Turkey had been defeated, and there was some restlessness in Asia Minor because the Allied powers had not immediately imposed a peace treaty on Turkey, and there was some resistance movement on the part of Turkish military figures to submit to defeat. Uh, the Allied powers, uh, led by a British prime minister whose name was David Lloyd George, authorized the Greek army uh, and the uh, Greek prime minister whose name was Venizelos to land uh, Greek uh, troops here in this city. Uh, I want to, we must remember it's a part of the Ottoman Empire. It's a part of the Turkish Empire, even though the largest ethnic element living in the city is Greek, followed by the Levantines, followed by the Turks, followed by the Armenians, who are really quite a small number of, uh, by percentage, but nonetheless very important. The uh, landing of the Greek army in uh, Smyrna, or Izmir, <coughs> in... Uh, May of 1919, set off a three-year period of struggle uh, against the rising nationalist forces in Turkey, led by their heroic, charismatic general known as, uh, known as Mustafa Kemal, today known as Ataturk, today regarded as the George Washington of Turkey, and you cannot go into any school anywhere, even Armenian churches, where you can, uh, where the a photograph and portrait of Mustafa Kemal is missing. It's everywhere. It's everywhere, uh, and so he becomes truly the, in a sense, the creator of the new state of Turkey, and is almost deified uh, in um, in the process. Uh, in 1922, the Greek army 
uh, approached Ankara, where, which, uh, uh, well, if we go back, uh, let's leave it there, approached Ankara, where uh, Mustafa Kemal's headquarters were. But a, 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 a heroic uh, last-ditch battle on the part of the Turks uh, demoralized the Greek armies, and they started to retreat. And they went into rapid retreat in the uh, summer, late summer, and August of 1922. Uh, I'm not going to go into internal Greek politics. Part of it was a result of the, the struggle between the royalists and the republicans in Greece and the, the whole mix-up that took place at that time. But in any case, you had a huge Greek army that is retreating helter-skelter to, um, towards Smyrna, and in front of them are fleeing thousands upon thousands of Christians who are afraid of the retribution of the advancing Turkish armies. And so, while um, the Smyrna may have 200,000 or 250,000 inhabitants, by September of 1922, there were a half million people uh, in Smyrna and around Smyrna seeking some kind of safety uh, uh, or uh, escape. The Greek army escaped uh, to the, for the most part, to the Greek islands, uh, and the civilian population was left. But, <coughs> but the civilian population perhaps uh, did not feel so threatened because Smyrna was an international city. Uh, all the European powers were there. And in the Bay of Smyrna, come in the next one, uh, in, in the Bay of Smyrna uh, were uh, allied warships. American, French, British, Greek, Italian vessels were like a few hundred yards off of this um, uh, off of this beautiful Bell Vista. You can see this is the, these are the seafront homes of Smyrna, where the wealthy would live. And here was the harbor. Next, this is uh, Rue Franc. It was a doesn't look so. Uh, uh, glorious today, but it was a very major trading center. You could find all the European goods, uh, fabrics, uh, supplies that you could want along the Rue Franc. Next, the, the Kramer Hotel. Everybody lived. Everybody who was anybody came to the Kramer Hotel on the waterfront. Next, and the theater. And the theater is very important for the Armenians of Smyrna. Next, uh, let's go back here. Yep. Uh, uh, this is um, Saint Foti. Uh, I'm sorry. This is um, no, no. Uh, uh, Polycarp. Uh, 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 Polycarp was the first bishop of uh, Smyrna who was martyred, and uh, so this is a Catholic church of Polycarp. Next, and this is the Greek uh, Orthodox Cathedral of Fotini. Next. And here we see the Armenian quarter. And here is the church of Serp Stepanos. Look at the well-constructed homes and businesses all around where there were some uh, uh, five to 8,000 Armenians living in this quarter and then the others living in other areas. Uh, when the Turkish army entered the city, and that occurred on uh, September 9th of 1922, at first, people felt relieved because they entered the city in, in good order. They marched into the city, and there was, of course, a great deal of fanfare. Uh, but it looked like the Turkish generals uh, in command were going to respect the uh, civilians, uh, civilian life. Uh, this uh, optimism uh, turned to utter horror uh, four days later when on September 13, 1922, fires were set throughout the Armenian quarter, and uh, 5,000 Armenians gathered into the Sup Stepanos church, but again were driven out as the <coughs> flames approached and hand grenades were thrown over the church wall. And so they became a part of the mass of humanity that um, was forced along the waterfront, the quay, which is no longer probably uh, no broader than 
this room or twice the distance of this room, in which uh, some hundred to 200,000 people were crammed because the fire was behind them, the sea was in front of them, and Turkish armies were both to the north and south uh, of these um, entrapped humanity. The saddest, uh, perhaps, episode or aspect of this calamity, which destroyed Christian Smyrna, and the Turks called it Gyavur, the Gyavur city, meaning the city of the infidels, the city of the infidels, um, was the fact that American, British, and French vessels that were less than a quarter mile away because of the changing political climate in Europe and the beginning of trying to court and to make peace with the new Turkey of Mustafa Kemal, were given orders to remain strictly neutral, not to become involved in any way. And at first, neutrality meant not even taking refugees on board. And so in the first day of the fire, as it spread, and thousands of people jumped into the water and went out toward the allied vessels. They were thrown back in the water with water hoses and clubs, not to be allowed uh, on, on board. American eyewitnesses and British eyewitnesses uh, who were there, including reporters, including uh, sailors themselves, were just um, stunned by seeing this beautiful fire, you know, fires at night can be beautiful, the whole city burning, a mass of humanity in front of them, and people coming out toward the ships and being knocked back. As a matter of fact, and I don't think I'm going to read it, but I'll just tell you, one or two of the correspondents said it was really weird because when the shrieks of the victims on the seaside became so great, the captain of the British flagship ordered the ship's band to start playing to sound, drown out the sounds of the, sh uh, 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 of the victims. Uh, and uh, this was again repeated by another American who said it was really weird to have five or six bands playing at the same time while the city was burning and people were dying. And the descriptions of the cruelty of the Turkish army by um, British correspondents who were right there watching, they could see it, of Turkish soldiers coming along and seeing these hundreds of, of, of people hanging over the dock, trying to save themselves, and chopping their arms off so that they would fall into the sea and die. So it's this kind of cruelty that is a part of the legacy of the destruction of Smyrna. Fortunately, uh, after about a day, the Allied uh, armies or the, uh, the vessels um, were given orders it was now okay to take refugees aboard. And in the next two or three days, they were able to rescue some five or 6,000 people, and eventually to get them to the Greek islands or to Greece. <coughs> but five or 6,000 out of 150 or 200,000 is only a small dent in the uh, uh, greater calamity uh, to which all these populations were subjected. Finally, in the second half of September, the Allies were able to negotiate with the Turkish commanders to allow the evacuation of the remaining Greek and Armenian population. And during the latter half of September, Greek and Allied vessels were able to take on board nearly 100,000 refugees and transplant them to Greece. Another 100,000 Greeks and Armenians as well, 
were taken as hostages, and particularly the young men, taken as hostages and sent into the interior of Turkey, much like reminiscent of the Armenian deportations of 1915. Now this population, nearly 100,000 um, victims, are transported to the interior of Turkey, where there are sort of um, bartering chips. And just as there was a huge mortality rate among the Armenian deportees of 1915 and 1960, there was equally a huge mortality rate among the Christian population that was deported. Uh, so just about this time, the first week of October in 1922, the relief operation came to an end. Christian Smyrna was in ashes. A rich culture and history of Hellenism in Asia Minor uh, was being eliminated or had been eliminated. And the process of turning this uh, multi-ethnic city into a mono-ethnic city was well advanced. I'd like to focus, if I may, just a little bit on why Smyrna is so important in Armenian history. Uh, as I pointed out, it's far away from the historic Armenian homelands, uh, well, uh, uh, way to the east. Uh, but, but Armenians were not newcomers to Smyrna in uh, 1915, 1920, or 18. They had been there at least from the 13th century, that's six or 700 years, because we have, you know, Smyrna was a part, uh, prior to the Turkish Empire, there was the Greek Empire known as the Byzantine Empire. And Smyrna was a part of the Byzantine Empire, and we have documents signed uh, by the authorities of the Greek emperors or the Byzantine emperors, and Itali Italian city-states, Liverno and others, of trade agreements in which Armenian merchants are mentioned already in the 13th century. In, not, in 1375, <coughs> in 1375, the last Armenian kingdom of Cilicia, Kilikia, fell to the a Muslim Mamluks, and much of the population scattered to the four winds, some to the Greek islands, some to Europe, and some numbers came here to Smyrna as well, and in, uh, increased the number of um, inhabitants. And then others came from Harpert, from Gesaria, and all the way east from the plain of Ararat. We've heard of Julfa, which had been a major center of trade, but in the 17th and 18th centuries, the Turks and Persians were at war continuously. And uh, many people fled the uh, Pers Persian uh, Ottoman Wars and uh, found greater safety far to the west in places like Smyrna. Here, Smyrna uh, figures in the Armenian Enlightenment very, very centrally. As you probably know, uh, after a long period of cultural backwardness, and darkness, superstition, uh, domination by the church, uh, and not much tolerance for enlightened thought. In the 18th and 19th century, that began to change. It began to change because it had changed in Europe. It had changed uh, in the enlightenment of Europe. It had changed in the French Revolution, where uh, the concept of the rights of man, the rights of nations, to be equal, to be born equal, uh, was a revolutionary thought that eventually reached out to the Armenians. Smyrna became, therefore, a center of Armenian enlightenment with um, numerous schools, the most important of which was the St. Mesrop School, the Mesropian Varjaran, uh, created or uh, opened in 1840 already, and through which, uh, through which 
generation after generation of young Armenian students and intellectuals passed. Going on then to Europe for further education, coming back to Smyrna as teachers, as publicists, as writers, as dramatists, and as champions of what we can call the utilitarian language. And when I say utilitarian language, I mean the language of the people to teach the people to understand in their own spoken language, in their ashkara bash, the language of the world, the vulgar, vulgate language, about which there, as you um, know, there was a long period of controversy and battles among intellectuals about do we stay true to our beautiful Mesropian 5th century language and writing, Grabar, which any you know, self-respectful person you would think would say yes, just as for a long time in Europe, the intellectuals would say there is nothing intellectual other than Latin. Latin was the language for Western Christendom. But there comes a time in the history of all people, of all, almost all people at least, when they begin to think. And as they begin to think, they want to share their ideas. And to share their ideas, they need to speak and write in the language of the people. And with Constantinople, Smyrna and Constantinople, these two cities, become the champions or the leaders in establishing a standard Western Armenian dialect, uh, the written language which we today accept as well, the uh, uh, acceptable um, uh, popular language that had a utilitarianism to it because these intellectuals wanted to teach and to preach. And they did that through their Newspapers, already in the 1840s, the Armenians had newspapers, and through the rest of the 18, 19th century <coughs> and into the early um, uh, 20th century, had at least a dozen Armenian newspapers and journals uh, published in this city. Next. Here you see the Armenian Quarter. This is taken from Professor Hewson's uh, Atlas on Armenia. And you see here uh, the uh, church of um, Sub Stepanos with the archbishop's uh, residence, and right next to it the Mesropian school, which was so important in the lives of this community. And farther up to the right, <coughs> the Armenian Machitaris uh, school, which had a very large enrollment, and the Armenian Catholics were very active uh, in Smyrna. And then farther up to the top, of the map, uh, you will find the uh, uh, the Protestant uh, meeting house or uh, Protestant church, along with the girls. Uh, again, uh, talking about enlightened Smyrna is pushing for uh, uh, women's education as well as male education, and the creation of the Haripsimians school or Haripsimian school. <coughs> <coughs> um, brought generations of young women uh, here. So this is the Armenian Quarter, totally obliterated today. <laughs> Nothing can be found. Next. Here is a street um, in the Armenian Quarter. Um, you can see the balconies are very traditional uh, for this city. Next. Uh, this is Serb Stepanos the uh, Mother Cathedral. There were three churches, at least, in Smyrna and other churches in outlying cities. For example, before I went traveling this area, I had heard these names, but they didn't become reality to me until I saw a place known as Udemish of uh, uh, Kasaba, where uh, Alec Manugian of the AGBU was born. All of these, Manisa, uh, which is old Magnesia, where the, they had two churches 
uh, with most of the population coming originally from Harper region and maintaining their Harper dialect way over here in the west for a very long time. Next. Here we have a, a, a lithograph of a 19th century Armenian priest. They tend still to be rather fat, I think, and I, I'm, the last one, I'm the last one that should say that, but <laughs> uh, well fat in any case. Next. Uh, this is the uh, inner courtyard of Srub Stepanos. Next. <coughs> the interior of the church. Next. The altar. Next. And here we have the Mesropian school. The Jemaran, if you will. Next. And here you look at the students and the faculty, and you see how. Uh, well-dressed uh, they are. When I compare them to the, my students today who come in <laughs> shorts and torn jeans and uh, whatever, t-shirts are falling apart, and then compare them with this, you can see, I'm not sure we're going forward or backward, but uh, here they were, 19th century already. Next. And here they are, graduating class in a, of science with their professor and all with ties and jackets and what their daily, which was their daily wear in school. Next. And ath athletics are very important uh, in national movements, national revivals, sports units. You know, we have uh, various today, various youth groups which are focused on athletics and it's a way to emphasize their connection and identity. And here we have the Mesropian School Athletic Club. Next. And now, uh, this is the Harib Simeon School. It looks similar, built in the same style, uh, and, but uh, some uh, few blocks away from the uh, Mesropian School. Next. And here you see the students and the faculty. Uh, and if you looked at, looked at missionary pictures of American missionaries, you see they look very much alike, the way they dress and so forth. And, and Smyrna was an important American missionary center. They, in the volume, this volume that I've just edited on Armenian Smyrna, uh, uh, Barbara Mergarian from uh, Boston has a chapter on the American missionary press. Um, and and uh, next. Here we find again the graduating class. This poor woman is the head mistress, and she had the misfortune in 1915 to be in Sebastia, and was taken away with her husband and killed. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that her girls were all right because Smyrna was not uh, touched in 1915, but was, of course, in 1922. Next. This is the Catholic school, the Mesropian school, with their fathers and, again, a very significant student body. Next. The Boy Scouts, uh, or the Athletic, uh, no, I take that back. This is the, uh, I believe, the Arara and Vaskuraga football teams, their soccer teams. Next. And Armenian Boy Scouts. Armenian Boy Scouts, the scouting movement being, again, one way in which to inculcate the uh, Armenian children with a sense of patriotism uh, toward their nation. Next. This is the American school in a place known as Paradiso Paradise, which is about two miles north of the city. Uh, here we are in 1915, a student convention, and nearly all of these students are Greeks or Armenians. Very few non-Greeks, non-Armenians attended the American International College. Next. And here's another picture of it. Next. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, numerous intellectuals uh, came um, from this area. Um, these are the Armenian, uh, Stepo, Stepan Voskanyan, um, Chilingerian, Matiosian, Robert Hewson's relative, and he's written a, a chapter on Matiosian, and the Dedean, one of the Dedean brothers who had one of the most important printing presses there. Uh, these, each person has a very important story, but collectively we could say they were all champions of teaching 
and learning a modern Western Armenian as the uh, language of the people, and also all of them opposing oppression and autocracy, looking and sometimes very, being very critical of the Armenian religious leadership, and seeking, uh, seeking uh, a democratization. And they all look forward at one time or another to a future, to a future republican form of government for the Armenian people. A republic, not a kingdom, not a czar, not a sultan, but a people's democracy. And so the, these were the uh, inland. Now they also, these four men by themselves, probably translated at least 75, perhaps 100 European novels into Armenian because there was a huge demand for European literature at the time. And so they translated nearly the whole repertoire of Shakespeare, of uh, Montague, of, of uh, Goethe. They went all the way from Russian doing Tolstoy. I mean, from Russian, from Italian, from German, from uh, French, from English, they're translating for an avid reading public here. And so this translation literature in itself is uh, worth more than one PhD dissertation. Next. And you see, uh, not all people were intellectuals, but Armenians here have uh, learned to become fig packers. And we have, uh, I know we're very close to what we used to call the fig gardens here. And the Armenians brought from Smyrna the Smyrna fig right here to Fresno. And you can see here uh, the Almasian brothers' uh, uh, fig uh, packing plant. All these are dried figs. And uh, Armenian women and men are there employed with these um, uh, fig packing. Next. And here you see uh, the men uh, lined up. Here is the Almasian fig factory in Smyrna. Next. And Armenian women at car. Carpets are very important. You know, uh, Armenians in the, up until the modern period, were the major purveyors and transporters of silk. But when silk went down, as it did go down, they then turned to cotton, to carpets, uh, figs, and other products. Next. Uh, these are today um, uh, Smyrna pieces in the Armenian Library and Museum in Watertown, Massachusetts. Uh, these, uh, in this book of mine, uh, Christina Maranci, uh, who is a professor of art history at Tufts University, has done this chapter and shown this pillow, uh, a rug pillow, uh, that comes from Smyrna. Next. Next. You see the doilies, uh, the crocheting for which they were famous. Next. Let's go back one. Let's go back if we can. And here you also see the uh, the lace work that is uh, done. Next. Uh, around, uh, around Smyrna, or Izmir, were all these other places with Armenian communities, with churches and schools. Menemen, Manisa, Turgutlu, which is Kasaba, uh, Torbatlu, Bayandir, Odemish, Tire, uh, and down to where Ephesus is, uh, right here. So in this arc, uh, there were, as I say, about 25,000, some people want to say 50,000, I'm conservative, at least 25,000 Armenians, and probably together with about 20 or 30 uh, schools and at least 10 or 15 churches in the larger towns and villages here. Next. Uh, this is now not in High Notes. High Notes was the Armenian quarter. If you leave High Notes toward the north, you can see the Armenians here have in a place known as Burnova, they have their mansions. And here is a typical Armenian mansion that today still survives and has been made into a part of one of the Turkish schools. Next. And here, uh, here are the water. And these are suburbs everywhere. And it, you, uh, it says the, uh, uh, the suburb of, uh, of uh, Karatash. And here you see the Armenian church of Karatash which is Surp Karabit. Next. And, next. and in the same city, the Vartanian 
uh, school, which is today made into the local museum. Next. Another view of the Vartanian school. Next. And here are the Vartanian school children, co-educational uh, school. With This is the women's or uh, girls' portion. Next. Manisa, where there were two Armenian churches uh, uh, not to be seen today. And as you see, it's very pretty. Uh, countryside and uh, early uh, early immigrants here from Kharkiv. Next, uh, this is a, a, a place known as Kharatash. Next, Kirkachach, and here's Trupas Fazazin Church. Now these are about an hour or two outside of Smyrna. Next, and here is the local school. Next. Uh, now we're in a place called Idimish, which had a very significant Armenian population, church and schools. Next. And you see here is the um, Gomidas Choir of this city, a choir. And here we have an interesting thing of having two football teams, one from Smyrna and one from Id Idimish, uh, in competition. So and, and at those days, it would take probably a whole day's journey or a half day's journey to get from one city to another. And yet it became important for these uh, inter-community athletic uh, events to take place. Next. Again, the, the graduating class in uh, Idemish. Next. And now we're at the fire. Uh, all of that which we have seen, unfortunately, came to an end in September of 1922. These uh, pictures are taken from the ship. And you can see already that these buildings have been gutted. There's virtually nothing left in them because you can see right through them. And the fire has moved over to this quarter. And look how close the Americans and British were right to the fire. They could feel the heat of the fire. And imagine here along the way with 100,000 people crowded in this little strip of land, how it, it, when they talk about an inferno, I mean, it was being like being in an oven. And some people pre preferred to throw themselves in the river or the, the water and die uh, to drown than to continue to endure that. Next. Again, here, is the, here are the bounds of the Great Fire. Here is the Armenian Quarter. Uh, uh, here are the Greek Quarters. Here is the... European quarter, and fortunately there's a railway here, and on the other side of the railway, the Jewish quarter and the Turkish quarter were not touched. Next. Pictures of the Quay side. Next. Here, you see the American flag right here? Here's the American flag, and they're that close. That close. Next. The refugees. Next. Uh, this is the uh, Greek Archbishop of Smyrna, a very brave man who refused um, advice to abandon the city. And he said he would not abandon his city. He would stay with his people to the very end. And uh, the Turkish mob fell upon him and tortured him to death. They never mutilated him and tortured him to death. And he's truly a, a martyr. Uh, uh, in the Orthodox world. Next. Here's a city after the fire. You can see everything burned out. Next. Next. <coughs> this is the sports club where Greeks and Armenians, you know, upper crust, upper crust Greeks and Armenians, this was their Sunnyside Country Club uh, of, uh, of early 19th, 20th century. A beautiful, right on the sea coast, on uh, the seaside. And here's the sports club after the fire. Uh, Got it out. Next. The American um, consulate before and the American consulate after. Next. And here's the city and the Armenian quarter in um, uh, end of September. 1922. And I'm going to stop here for just a minute and tell you that there's a big controversy about who really burned Smyrna. The Turkish state narrative, the 
Turkish state story is that in fact it was the Armenians who burned the city. The Armenians burned the city, they say, because they didn't want their goods and properties to fall into the hands of the Turks. And so they preferred, the Armenian revolutionaries, preferred to burn the city, the entire city, than to uh, leave it uh, uh, to the Turks. And interestingly enough, there were a number of uh, Western observers who supported this point of view. Well, the most important of whom was probably the American commissioner in Constantinople, whose name was Mark Bristol, Admiral, Vice Admiral Mark Bristol, who was a um, um, dyed-in-a-wool American capitalist who didn't have, who had no interest uh, or humanitarian uh, concern for Greeks, for Jews, for Armenians. He said they're all put them in a bag and you know shake them up, and they're all the same rotten stuff. Um, and uh, who be befriended Mustafa Kemal, who wanted to become the American sort of bridge to the new Turkey and to keep the doors of commerce open. His main interest was in commerce, the open door for American trade uh, being pushed by Bristol. He and a number of others, including surprisingly the uh, president of the American International College, in Smyrna, agreed to uh, the uh, Turkish interpretation, saying, well, um, yeah, it, does, it doesn't make any sense at all, doesn't make any sense at all for the Turks to have burned the city, which was their great prize. Uh, it had all kinds of wealth, it had food, everything that they wanted, so why would they do it? And they accepted the view that even though there were eyewitnesses showing that Turkish soldiers and even Turkish officers were going in and out of the Armenian homes with lighted uh, wicks burning and then came out. They said, well, those were Armenians who were disguised in <laughs> Turkish uniforms. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, there are many others who give another point of view. George Horton, we saw the American consulate. He was in the American consulate right at the time when the fire began and witnessed himself, and I'm not going to read it. Uh, it's not only is it dark, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, reading takes some, something away from the immediacy, but, but his uh, testimony is very interesting. And he said, I, I, I saw this happening. The Turks, he said, civilians uh, started this. They were, they were sniping at any Armenian they could find sniping at any Armenian they could find. And then uh, he saw with his own eyes uh, the Turkish officers uh, lighting the fires, as did, as did the uh, headmistress of the American college, which also burned, the American Girls College in um, Smyrna, who said, you know, she saw it. it. She says, we saw this, not only I, but all our teachers witnessed what was going on, and there was burning uh, by the Turkish soldiers and officers. If I were to um, summarize all the arguments, it would take a long time. But I think that um, we're fortunate that today a number of younger Turkish scholars are trying to seek the truth. And uh, for one um, woman sociologist and historian at Boğaziçi University in um, Istanbul, she deals with uh, space, um, social spaces. And her interpretation is quite interesting. Uh, not only has she done a lot of interviews with people who had been soldiers in the Turkish army, who almost you know, very proudly talked about uh, killing right and left all the gyaburs, all the infidels. You know what I find interesting is they talk about the gyaburs and Armenians, which meant that they reserved the term gyabur for Greeks. The Greeks were the gyaburs, the infidels, plus the Armenians, and they talk about um, uh, how they uh, went through the streets killing, killing them, some, some degree of pride in this. Uh, and she goes on to say, look, in the creation of a uh, new space, 
What was going on was a transformation of an Ottoman city into a Turkish town, a Turkish city. And in that process, in that process, it was important to wipe out that which had been, to punish, to punish Smyrna for having resisted, to punish Smyrna for having been the uh, base for the Greek armies, to destroy. And destruction, she says, is an act of creation. Destruction, fire, is an act of purification. And the Turkish uh, armies engaged in an act of violence, burning and killing as a means of retribution and especially of purification that led to creation. And they, uh, she's right in the sense that from the ashes of Smyrna has now grown this beautiful city of Izmir. Uh, still a jewel of a city, just as it was in the time of the Greeks and the Armenians. But now, an entirely different city, where you cannot even find the old streets. New streets all laid out, uh, beautiful buildings, Hilton hotels, 36 stories high, right in the heart of the Armenian quarter. What was the Armenian? And so this sad uh, story, um, before I bring it to an end, I perhaps want to have a little optimism. Uh, we could have the next one. Here is um, here's the city of Smyrna today, Izmir, right from the Armenian quarter. And these next two slides, you see the great uh, bay of Smyrna. It's a, it's a natural gulf and harbor <coughs> that's been there since antiquity. Next. <coughs> Again, a modern city, a very modern city. When you, uh, 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 Vartu went with me and my wife, said she could not believe that she was in Turkey. It was just for her a European city. And in many ways, the Armenians of Smyrna and the Greeks of Smyrna felt that themselves. They were not a part of Oriental world. They were a part of the European world, and perhaps that was a part of their undoing, of being a part of that European world. Next. And a final view from the Armenian. What you see where the trees are, uh, uh, this is where the uh, Armenian Haripsime school were, was, the Armenian Protestant church was, and down uh, toward the center is where Substepanos. Now, about a half hour north of uh, Smyrna is a small town known as Menemen. And I had heard there was an Armenian church there. I wasn't sure how it was. And just by luck, uh, with Vartiter, we got out. We took one of these um, dolmushes, you know, these sort of sure. people's taxis. And just by instinct, uh, along the way, because it was going about 20 miles, I asked the driver to stop. And within 10 minutes, just by following our noses, we had discovered that we discovered the church of Sursakis. Of Menemen. Next. Here is the church that still stands today of Supsarkis, uh, of, of Menemen. <coughs> and what the positive, perhaps, final comment is that the city of Menemen has declared a historical site and has uh, called for its renovation and restoration through European Union funds. There's a, you know, the European Union gives them money for restoration of the various things. And the fact that they have chosen an Armenian church uh, to be among the municipal buildings gives us a little hope, not much, but a little hope that perhaps there will be the preservation and restoration of other sites. And I think this next one is my last one. And here you see... <coughs> <coughs> the interior of the church, its columns, uh, pretty trashy, the floors dirty, manure, etc. But uh, hope, hope that uh, there might be a at least a maintenance of Armenian memory 
and the acceptance of the fact that this city of Smyrna, with its Hellenic population, with its Armenian population, with its multiculturalism, um, that the loss of it is a loss for all people, and not least of whom, a loss for the Turkish people, whom, whom, whose intellectual leaders today are the first to state this. Thank you very much.